Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, hope you can all hear me okay. Um, recording. Um, the, we're recording this talk as we do with all our talks, so uh, please be aware of that. So thank you. My name is Joe Houlihan. Uh, I'm the convener for the Military History Group at the Bath uh, Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. Um, so shortly I'll be introducing tonight's very distinguished speaker. First, a little bit of housekeeping. During the talk, it would be helpful if you could turn off your, your video and mute yourself. That just so we don't get barking dogs and the doorbell ringing when the uh, Ocado chap arrives, etc. Uh, it's always very helpful. And um, after the talk, you, you're very welcome to turn your camera back on and unmute yourself. Um, but bear in mind, we are recording the talk and it will appear later on on the website and on our YouTube channel. So if you don't want your image to appear in that way, um, perhaps uh, for whatever reason, perhaps you're on the run from Interpol, then uh, keep your video turned off. Um, we, uh, You're very welcome to ask questions during the talk uh, in the chat function, the Zoom chat function. And at the end, we'll have we'll go through all the questions, at which point you're also very welcome to turn your video on, unmute yourself, and um, ask your question in person if you prefer. If you send them in the chat function, I'll uh, I'll... So sort of keep an eye on them and make sure they get asked at the end. So tonight's talk is part of the military history program here at the, the BRLSI. If you'd like to be kept informed about future military history talks, please uh, send me your email in the chat function and I will make sure your email address is added to the a little list I keep to update everyone on, on new talks. Um, now that's pretty much enough from me. Uh, I know you're all eager to hear from tonight's speaker, uh, Judith Green. So Judith is Emerita Professor, Professor of Medieval History at the University of Edinburgh, specialising in Anglo-Norman England. Um, she's published books uh, in the past on Henry I and on the aristocracy of Norman England. Her new book, about which she'll be talking tonight, is um, The Normans, Power, Conquest and Culture in 11th Century Europe. And I can tell you, having read it, that it's a first-rate work of uh, scholarship, but also a cracking good read, because, uh, frankly, the Normans are a terrific story. Um, so on that note, I will pass over to Judith. Uh, Judith, please uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Joe, and thank you to the institution for inviting me this evening. Um, I'm going to give a fairly straightforward lecture, but uh, I'm hoping that we'll have some images as well. And let's start with the most familiar date of all, which is 1066, conjuring up William the Conqueror and his Normans defeating the English king and his foot soldiers. The story plays out on the Bayer Tapestry, whose illustrations are regularly used in newspaper cartoons without any need for explanatory comment. In England, the country was brought under French-speaking conquerors. In Italy, Normans were busy establishing themselves against Lombards, Byzantines and Arabs. And then in 1095, Normans both from Normandy and from southern Italy answered the Pope's call for a crusade to free the city of Jerusalem. And the next two slides are, as I was explaining to Joe, these are the hand-drawn um, slides I sent into the press. So they are my very own work, complete with smudges and what have you. But just to orientate you to some of the uh, places that I'll be talking about, perhaps, um, for example, Ragusa is more familiar to us as, as Dubrovnik, um, Duras as Durazzo, um, Dory Lion, which was one of the scenes of, of battle in the First Crusade, for example, and then round to Edessa, Aleppo, Antioch, and, and the rest are fairly well known. And the next slide is a, uh, a more detailed uh map of southern Italy to show some of the, fam the famous sites associated with the Normans. Um, the area around here is the Campania, the toe of Italy, Calabria, Apulia is the heel, Monte Sant'Angelo here is otherwise known as the Gargano Peninsula, where the famous shrine of St. Michael, that I'll be mentioning, um, uh, is located and the Abruzzi, Monte Cassino I'll be mentioning 
and the great battle of Chiditate in 1053. So the stories told by and about the Normans are threaded through with military victories. The Storming Normans, one might say, and I tried this title on Yale, um, but they thought it was too colloquial to count for, to, to use for the title of the book. So in the first part of this talk, I'd like to explore the reality and possible explanations for their successes before turning secondly to say a little bit about their impact in the context of new approaches to the subject. The very beginning of Ducal Normandy, we're told, was when a Viking leader, we tend to call him Rollo, but it's Thorolfa or Roux in French, was granted land in northwest France in order to protect the Seine Valley from other Vikings. Rollo became a hero and was celebrated in the 19th century by statues in Normandy, in Norway, uh, where the freeing of Nor Norway from Sweden uh, chimed with the, the 19th century love of, of statues. And even in Fargo, North Dakota, for the same reason, if you Google the statue of Rollo, you'll find him there in North Dakota. Actually, very little little is known about him or even where he came from. There's a strong tradition has him as a Dane. Um, the first historian of the Normans, Dudo, thought he was a Dane, but he may have been from uh, the Norwegian area or even an exile from the Hebrides. However, his followers were probably Danes, but I'm, I'm hesitating here because you probably know the Norwegians, the Scandinavian states have not really been established in this era. But Rollo and his successors managed to keep their independence from rival princes who had taken over from the Carolingians and also from other regional Viking groups. For example, one at Bayeux, which Dudo has quite a lot to say about. So that by the end of the first millennium, Normandy was a relatively strong and cohesive uh, polity and the, its rulers began to call themselves Duke. And it's around this time, the turn of the first millennium, that Normans are first mentioned in southern Italy, cropping up as mercenaries and as returning pilgrims who took up arms. There's nothing unique about Normans as soldiers of fortune. Young men from different regions of Europe went off to fight those who had paid them. Normans fought in Scotland for Macbeth, in England for Edward the Confessor, in Spain against the Moors, and then in Italy both for and against the Byzantine rulers of Apulia. And the Normans knew about Italy. Clergy and pilgrims went back and forth. Rome and the shrine of St Michael at Gargano were destinations. The Normans had a particular attachment to the military saint St. Michael, and as well as Mont Saint-Michel, um, the, the shrine at Gargano, um, Monte Sant'Angelo, is the, the other important European site of veneration. So Gargano and Rome, of course, for its associations um, with St. Peter, and Bari, from which um, pilgrims took ship for the Near East, this was the great route over unless you took the land route via Constantinople to get to the Holy Land. So Normans would have known they'd have been well aware of the prospects for landless young men who'd been trained to fight. Amongst the most successful were the sons of a Norman called Tancred de Oakville, who hailed from a village near Coutances. And two of the many sons were especially important. Robert, named Giscard the Wily One, and his younger brother, Roger, the great Count of Sicily, and stories gathered around them both. On one occasion, Robert gained access to a monastery by having one of his men pretend to be dead and carried within the walls. If there are any budding film directors, I have to say the stories about the Normans would make wonderful films. It, Robert's brother, Roger, was instrumental in the conquest of Sicily from its North African lords. And at one critical battle at Cherami, there were visions of warrior saints riding into battle beside the Normans. And ultimately, the Kingdom of Sicily was to be established in 1130 under Roger's son, Roger II. But the hero most of us are familiar with is, of course, William the Conqueror. 
And my next slide has a, a, another splendid 19th century statue. I was saying to Joe that one of the interesting things about writing this book was you get you get involved in all these sidelines. And one of them, again, I think ripe for somebody to write a book about is this 19th century trend to have heroes. Um, and of course, at the moment, statues are a very sensitive subject. But here we have William the Conqueror in the centre of Falaise, where he was born, with the earlier Dukes of Normandy round the base. And this statue was actually, well, the, the, these Duke, um, the other rulers were put up by public subscription. So it's a popular activity, which is interesting. So the Conqueror was the illegitimate son of Duke Robert I, who fought his way to establish himself in Normandy and then took over Maine to the south um, and invaded England in 1066. He was said to have had three horses shot under him in the Battle of Hastings. It's like a cowboy film. He was ruthless campaigner and his harrying of northern England in the winter of 1069-70 resulted in the flight of refugees, in famine, and even, it was said, cannibalism. And the final heroes I want to mention are Bohemond, leader of the South Italian Normans on the First Crusade, and his nephew, Tancred, Prince of Galilee. Now, our views of the justification for Crusades obviously differ from those of the 11th century. At the time, the recapture of Jerusalem and the other holy places was seen as a great triumph. And it was only the crusading, and this was the only crusading expedition which actually achieved its aim. So the sieges and battles were soon celebrated in song and by Western chroniclers. And a group of them represented Bohemond as its leading figure, mighty Bohemond. And he was a giant of a man. Apparently his baptismal name was Bohemond, uh, was Mark, but he was nicknamed Bohemond after a, a, a giant who's lost to history. But Bohemond was one of the victors at the Battle of Dorylaeum in Turkey and then at the battles and two sieges of the great citadel of Antioch, nowadays Antakya in Turkey. Having scaled the walls, he and his men were admitted by one of the besieged. Bohemond, instead of handing the city back to the Byzantine emperor, hung on to it and stayed whilst the rest of the army went on to Jerusalem. His later career never hit the high points again. He was captured and ransomed, his captor having been persuaded to release him by his beautiful daughter Melas. Again, it's a, probably a story, but it may could have been true, I suppose. Bohemond returned to the West, having got out of prison, um, travelling round France on a promotional tour to raise funds. And he was so impressive at this that many named their babies after him, which, again, is, is a delightful touch. All these babies born in 1106 called Bohemond, I suppose slightly different from Wayne or whatever. Um, Bohemond's nephew, Tancred, in many ways, was just as successful, if not more so. He'd gone right through to Jerusalem on the First Crusade, then took over from Bohemond at Antioch, and it was he who really established the principality, fighting off hostile neighbours until his death in 1112. Lots of stories then, like the Muslim, beautiful, of course she was beautiful, the Muslim princess who obtained Bohemond's freedom, are likely to have been legendary or embroidered. But the myth of the all conquering Normans created both self-belief and helped to intimidate their enemies. The idea that all those who lived in Normandy were Normans, whether in fact they were Frankish origin or Scandinavian origin, promoted the ideal idea of a people, a natio. In fact, it's thought there were probably very few Viking settlers in the 10th century, one of the interesting things if you start reading about this is that whereas we're quite used to um, Viking fines, in, especially in those areas of England settled by the Danes, the Dane law, uh, brooches and arm rings and so on and so forth, there are actually very few Viking remains in Normandy. And the current thinking is that was because there were very few of them and they rapidly intermarried with the native Franks. But as a, as a people, their victories, according to their historians, showed 
that they and their leaders were favoured by God, a providential view of history which has not been uncommon in other eras and other peoples. Victories demonstrate God's favour, defeats illustrate weakness or wickedness. The Norman's victory at Hastings was explained in this way. The English had been good Christians, but had succumbed to riotous living, whereas the Normans were clean living and pious. Um, the night before the Battle of Hastings, the English spent it drinking, whereas the Normans spent it in prayer. This is William of Malmesbury. So myth matters in helping to create a sense of identity, but it also obviously has a role in intimidating the opposition. Their leaders had to attract men into their followings with the promise of success and reward. We're told that men flocked from all over France to answer Duke William's call to arms in 1066. In Italy, the Normans recruited from the local population. Count Roger, the great count, had Muslims in his army, which we know from a chance reference to the fact that Archbishop Anselm of Canterbury, who was in Italy in 1098, thought of converting them to Christianity and had to be dissuaded from the attempt. So at one level then, the story of the Normans is that of exceptional leaders. And I've got very interested in charisma as a, as a result of working on this, because there's no doubt that the individuals I've talked about were truly exceptional, but there is more to it. And in the book, I was explore, exploring some possible explanations. When I was an undergraduate, I was taught that Norman society was uniquely well geared up for war, training its sons to an exceptional degree of excellence in fighting on horseback in squadrons with lances under their arms. Um, in fact, my tutor used to say that, you know, it was it, the Normans had the advanced techniques, military techniques and horses, whereas the English were engaged in their usual practice at Hastings of fighting the war with weapons of the la and techniques of the last war because they were on foot and they were fighting with axes as well as swords. But it seems to me hard to argue that there are special features of Norman society which weren't present in other parts of Northwest Europe, like Brittany, Flanders, Anjou, England or Scandinavia, which also produced young men who went off to fight abroad. Elite warriors were now beginning not just to use horses as a means of transport, but they were fighting on horseback but they also fought on foot as circumstances demanded. The later decades of the 11th century were a time when it is thought cavalry tactics were beginning to change with the rise of heavily armed squadrons charging enemy lines using lances under their arms. But it seems to me we simply don't know whether the Normans had gone further down this route than others. Pitch battles were relatively rare, and the occasions when they were decided by cavalry charges were even rarer. The Battle of Civitati, which I showed you on the map um, in 1053, when the Normans faced a coalition army assembled by the Pope, was one of the few battles where clearly a cavalry charge was decisive. At Hastings, and I admit there are many different views about reasons to Norman victory, the decisive turning point followed William's use of archers to fire high in the air to break up the English line. And again, I'm happy to talk about the Battle of Hastings, and all of this is fairly speculative. Did the horses, did the Normans have better horses than the enemies? Those who know point out that the horses of nomadic peoples were usually smaller than the larger horses specially reared for war. And it's possible the Normans may already have been breeding such large horses. Um, there was a book some years ago by the late R.H.C. Davis who looked at this evidence and was arguing that the Normans were already had studs and they may have been importing um, stock from Spain through their contacts there. And the Bayer Tapestry has many horses. I think the latest estimate is around 190. 
and then notably stallions, which were always used in battle. Such horses had to be trained in special techniques for cavalry charges. I've heard actually uh, Lady Fielding on this, and she is both an expert on the Normans and on horses as a polo player. And and she was saying that actually um, the evidence for this is maybe less convincing than, than used to be thought. Um, it's obvious in any case, it seems to me, that on campaign you had to take what horses were available. Um, at the siege of Antioch, many horses died. I mean, and sometimes um, knights deliberately dismounted to fight on foot at the Battle of Tashbury in 1106 when Henry I defeated his elder brother. So overall then, the idea that the Normans were better trained or equipped with better horses than others as a major factor in their successes doesn't seem to me really to hold up. Um, it's not nuclear physics. They didn't have some kind of literally secret weapon. Most military engagements in this era took the form of sieges, where the control of food supplies and timber were crucial, what we would call logistics. Access to shipping was critical too, and this is an interesting area of recent research. One possibility in 1066 was that Harold was able to return south to London in the Battle of Stamford Bridge so quickly because he went by sea with his personal following rather than the 200 miles by road. The crucial sieges of Bari in Italy, Palermo in Sicily, and Duras Durazzo in Albania involved ships. The Crusaders often travelled by ships and were certainly supplied by sea in the Mediterranean and for transport to and from the Near East. It's clear, for example, that Count Roger, the great Count of Sicily, Robert Gustav's brother, uh, was pretty quickly... Um, sorry, what have I done here? Nothing, I hope. Um, can you all... Yes, that's fine. Sorry. So. Yeah, hi, hi Jim. Yes. This is Joe. Yeah, we can see every. We can still see anything. You're still on the uh, the image yeah, of William the Conqueror. In I, I pressed something and, and something happened. Mm, so no shipping. Um, Roger the Great Count was already beginning to make use of ships uh, in his early years in Sicily, and pretty soon was developing the naval shipyards. So intelligence gathering was another point that uh, was made a few years ago. You can see this actually on the Bayer tapestry that William, the Norman and Harold are exchanging messengers and trying to find out what, what each other um, had by way of uh, intentions and forces before committing them to battle in 1066. My own PhD supervisor was at Bletchley Park and he wrote a very interesting article on this, and he was the first person to point out that William the Conqueror, who didn't have actually all that much experience of pitch battles because they didn't happen very often, um, actually used intelligence very wisely in, in his military campaigns. So pulling this together, it seems to me that circumstances had a lot to do with the Norman success. The 11th century was a time when the rulers of far-flung empires were finding it hard to maintain their power, which was slipping away to the man on the ground. In northwestern Europe, the Danish kings who had established a North Sea empire under commuting his sons had given way in 1042 to the English Edward the Confessor, who died childless in January 1066. In southern Italy, the political landscape was notably contested, the Byzantine Emperor still held the southeast, Apulia. Campania was divided between Lombard princes and, and city states, and Calabria divided between Greeks, Lombards, and Arabs. Sicily had been conquered by Arabs from North Africa, but their influence was waning and local rulers were gaining power. In the Near East, the Byzantine Empire underwent a series of succession struggles in which different factions had recruited foreign troops, including Normans. 
The frontiers of the Byzantine Empire were under threat in the Balkans from Pechenex, in the east from Seljuks, and in the southeast from the empires centred on Baghdad and Cairo. Antioch, for instance, was at the interface and it passed back and forth between the Byzantines and most recently before the arrival of the Crusaders, the Seljuks. The 11th century was also time of fundamental changes in the Western Latin Church, and Normans were able to capitalise on these in a way that helped to justify and consolidate their territorial gains. (coughs) Around the turn of the millennium, the Pope was not yet clearly at the head of a hierarchy. The territorial diocese and parish clergy. There were calls for reform. (coughs) <coughs> that priests should be celibate and that money should not change hands for offices. <coughs> Both aims served the Normans well. In Italy, their relations with the popes got off to a rocky start. They were considered bandits because they preyed on Christians. One contemporary described as no men, not Normans. After 1053, when the pope's army had been defeated, The popes realised they were not going to get rid of the Normans, which had been their first idea. I began to work with them, though the relationship remained tricky. In 1084, Robert Giscar answered the then Pope's plea for help and arrived in Rome, where his Normans did more damage than the Pope's enemies. It was a case of be careful what you wish for. As the Normans brought southern Italy under their rule, New dioceses were set up and monasteries founded, and the same happened in Britain. Whilst the English church already had territorial dioceses, in Wales the church was radically transformed, and monasteries, especially those of the new orders such as the Cistercians, were founded. New Norman lords gave some of their ill-gotten gains to monks, who would say prayers for their souls and take care of the shrines of local saints, whether they were Italian Sicilian, English or Welsh. And pilgrimage and saints cults were central to piety in this era and shrines were places where conquerors and conquered came together. The Normans, as already noted, were conspicuous on the First Crusade with not one but two contingents, one led from Normandy by the Duke himself, Robert Curtos, eldest son of William the Conqueror, and the second by Bermond. Motives for going on crusade were inevitably mixed. I used to teach undergraduates who had to be dissuaded from the idea that you went off on crusade basically to have a good time and for adventure, uh, uh, and not that actually there might be religious motives involved or that you might not come back. But Duke Robert was one of those who went all the way to Jerusalem and took a leading role in all the major battles. Unlike some of the other commanders, he didn't seek land for himself and returned to Normandy. Bowman's motives were less disinterested. He saw the opportunity to return to the Byzantine Empire, where he had fought under his father's leadership, and to take what he could. In the event, this was the great city of Antioch. He was not the only leader to take land, but there's no doubt that the call to crusade happened at a convenient moment in his career. Basically, he was the son of a first marriage, and his father passed the lands of Apulia to his son by second marriage. So, too, did the death of Edward the Confessor happen at a convenient time as far as William the Conqueror was concerned, As I've said, the likelihood that there would be a contest for the throne when Edward died must have been glaringly obvious to all observers. There's been much discussion about Edward's reign, partly because the written accounts were composed after 1066 and in the knowledge of what had happened in that year. So it's actually quite hard to disentangle um, what Edward himself was planning But it looks as though he wanted the young Edgar, grandson of Edmund, um, sorry, of Ethelred, no, Edmund Ironside to succeed him. But Edgar was in his early teens when Edward died, and the throne, as we all know, was seized by Harold Godwinson, the king's brother-in-law, whose family had immense riches. 
Harold could claim no descent from the old English royal line, though his mother was related to the uh, Danish king, and Harold had critically fallen out with his younger brother Tostig. There were potential threats from the Danish and Norwegian kings, respectively Swain Estrus' son, Swain II of Denmark, and Harold Havrada. William took a big risk in embarking on a seaborne invasion, but his position in the duchy was more secure than it had been earlier, and he knew that it was now or never. The conquest of England was different from the other regions I've been talking about in terms of the greater numbers involved and the fact it was led by the Duke himself. So this leads me on to the second part of my paper, the impact of the Norman successes, and to try and give you a flavour of where recent research by scholars in, in all different parts of Europe has been um, trending. In general, I think perhaps the most important trend has been to emphasise differences between the theatres in which the Normans operated. It's tempting, and many historians have not avoided the temptation to see a single Norman world stretching from Macbeth, Scotland, to Spain, Italy, Malta, North Africa, Turkey and Syria. But this would be mistaken. The numbers and the status of the newcomers were very different, as were the societies into which they moved and therefore the impact they made. This is not to say there was no consciousness of Normanness expressed in, for example, in battle rhetoric. The speeches that were put into the mouths of commanders by chroniclers. Remember, guys, what we did at Hastings and Antioch, for instance. Um, but these are literary devices, and certainly commanders wouldn't have been able to make themselves heard in front of their troops, even if they had decided to address them. But the idea that there was a single Norman world tends to be played down nowadays. The impact made by the Normans was very considerable in England generally, and in this part of the world, Bath and Somerset, you would have noticed most dramatically changes. Norman lords took over from the old. They built castles and towns and at strategic sites in the countryside. Vast estates were given, for example, to the Bishop of Coutances, Geoffrey, who had been involved in the 1066 campaign, um, like the king's half-brother, Odo, Bishop of Bayeux, and the conqueror's half-brother, Robert, Count of Mortain. French became the new elite spoken language. There was very considerable reorganisation. The Lotharingian Bishop Gizo was based at Wells, but when he died, his successor, John of Marmoutier from the Loire Valley, who had been the conqueror's physician, um, made his headquarters at Bath. Outside England, the numbers of Norman settlers was much smaller and the societies into which they moved were more complex. I've already mentioned that southern Italy is already a complicated and fragmented political landscape, which had enabled, obviously, the Normans to get a toehold. Apulia, still under the rule of the Byzantines from Constantinople, Calabria and Campania, a mix of Lombard princes, some Greek settle settlements, um, and the cities of like uh, Naples and Amalfi and Gaeta were in effect independent. Sicily was ruled by Arabs. And what the Normans did not do was unify the South. Older views in Italian historic in historiography argue that the South was pulled together under the Normans, whereas the Norse, which became the economically more advanced, um, remained divided. But it's quite clear that there was sustained opposition to the Oakville family, and it took decades after Roger II was proclaimed king in 1130 to suborn, if you like, the remaining outposts of independence. In the crusading principality of Antioch, founded by Bermond, the Normans were fewer still. Then it's been shown in the early years there were Normans all right. Um, 
that the principality had come under the overlordship of the Kingdom of Jerusalem by the 1120s. And society here was obviously very different. Um, the, the settlers were fighting uh, on all fronts all the time. It was a society that had to be um, based on the ability to defend what they'd taken. So one way of looking at the impact made by the Mormons is to focus on political and societal change. And I guess those of us who were reared on 1066 and all that will think in terms of change from the top, changes of rulers, ruling dynasties, new lords, new bishops, new abbots, what we might call top-down history. The Normans have been seen as catalysts of strong centralising rule and therefore as state builders. An older generation of historians, for example, compared the strong rule of Henry I and of England and Roger II of Sicily in the early 12th century as creators of two of the strongest states in Europe. But times change, and nowadays historians are more interested in the idea of cultural encounters, the interactions between newcomers, Normans, and the natives. Questions are asked about how far Normans imposed French, how far they imposed their own laws. Did subject peoples have to live by the laws of the Normans or were they allowed to keep their own laws? What about their culture? How far did they impose their culture on native populations? And should we see a process of mixing or has recently been suggested in the case of Sicily, cultural hybridity, that the mixing of the cultures actually produces something new, which you wouldn't have recognised either in England, um, sorry, either in, in Normandy or Sicily. And it's got me thinking about um, Norman architecture in England because the churches the Normans put up in England were not like Norman churches at all. So how did the Normans deal with those of other religions they encountered, notably Jews and Muslims, whose laws and customs were to be applied? When the Norman monks arrived in England, Italy, how far did they change monastic practices and liturgical music? Um, in the wake of the Glastonbury Festival, one of the most notorious instances in um, the history of England under William the Conqueror occurred at Glastonbury, where a new Norman abbot tried to alter the music and bring in a Norman chant. And when the monks, who would have been English and recruited from family families who had suffered under the conquest, when the monks refused, the abbot sent in armed men who killed her, two of the monks. So how common was this? It seems there's been very interesting work done on the music at Monte Cassino, for example, which is such an important centre of South Italian monasticism, and there it looks as if old and new mingled together. Things like naming patterns, appearance, dress and diet have all been studied. In England after 1066, instead of Alfred and Athelstan, we find William, Robert, Richard, for example, in the New Elite. English girls' names survive for longer. The Normans on the Bayer Tapestry are clean-shaven with short hair up to the crown, I always think they look like the current crop of footballers. You look at, you know, them, uh, and, and they, they all got this short hair at the back and then, and then they sort of curls on top. And that's how the norms are shown on the bio tapestry. The English, on the other hand, had long hair, they had tattoos, and they liked posh clothes. In fact, um, that when they, William the Conqueror took hostages back to Normandy in 1067, the locals were absolutely stunned um, by the posh clothes. And in Danish settled areas, silver arm rings were probably still common as both ornaments and portable wealth. And I'd like to know when this fashion died out. Um, but fashion is something that historians have, have turned to thinking about recently. Our understanding of diet is being transformed by the study of bones and 
organic matter deposited at castle sites, archaeogenetics. By the 11th century, the English aristocracy were already turning to the consumption of deer and were enclosing deer parks, a trend which continued under the Normans. Eating exotic birds and animals was a mark of social status. But one of the more interesting finds of recent years was that looking at the cut marks on bones uh, found in middens, the Normans may have butchered their game differently. They certainly thought to have eaten more pork than the English did. And of course, it's the French word pork which passed into English usage rather than the English word pig or swine. In southern Italy, the Normans were said to have sent citrus fruits back to their relatives. Um, a basket of oranges arrives in Normandy and the message comes south. It's, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. And the Normans in the south certainly had greater access to deluxe products like silk and to sugar, which was cultivated as cane in Sicily by the Arabs. In the Near East, on the other hand, they encountered Muslims for whom the eating of pork was prescribed. So the study of animal remains and human remains through historical DNA is one of the most exciting of recent developments. But in a broader sense, understanding the range and implication of cultural interactions is thus complex, nuanced and protracted, difficult to sum up either as loss or gain. We tend to think of the world inhabited by the norms as resolutely male. There are only three women in the main panels of the biotapestry, and they are passive figures. One whose identity has never been established is thought to have been denounced for a sexual scandal. A second is Queen Edith, weeping at the bedside of her dying husband. And a third is holding a child by the hand and has been burnt out of her house. Yet one of the most interesting developments in recent years has been the recognition of the importance of families in Norman success. Women were key as wives and mothers. Intermarriage between Normans and natives could aid transition. Women sometimes went to war or on crusade. Robert Giscard, for instance, arrived in Italy dependent on his brothers for his prospects. He was unmarried and his first wife came with a dowry of 150 knights. And we're, here we have her tomb at Santa Tr Santissima Trinita Venosa. His second, having conveniently discovered that the first could be put aside, was to a Lombard princess whose family helped to secure his legitimacy in the south. When later in life Robert was besieging Duras in Albania, the second wife famously urged his soldiers on to battle. Halt! Be men! The castles and cathedrals built under Norman rule are some of the most tangible remains of their presence, and many have been studied, but many <coughs> excuse me, remain to be excavated, or like Antioch, have been buried under modern development. But we now understand much better <coughs> the relationship of these buildings to what went before. In southern Italy and the Near East, for example, there are already castles and fortified cities and settlements. Here we have Bari, and there you have the Norman Tower. <coughs> and the walls are obviously later, but um, the, the nucleus of the walls is um, going back before the Normans arrived. In the British Isles, elite residences were adapted and forts put within city walls. The possession of stone castles came increasingly to be seen as a symbol of status as well as power. And their surroundings planned around deer parks and fish pond. So where you see here, the, the Tower of Bari looks very functional and, and has to be seen in terms of defence. Here we have Castle Rising, which is built by uh, William Daubigny as a, a home fit for a queen because he married the widow of Henry I. And it has this very grand forebuilding with a, a, a grand staircase for ceremonial entries. So the idea of um, cultural norms as castles as part of planned medieval landscapes is quite new. All over Europe, stone churches were being built 
were the Normans to export an imperial architecture like the British in India? Well, in the first place, there's no single Norman style of architecture, but there is one famous example of a church, which this is the church of St. Nicola, St. Nicholas in Bari, and it is very similar to the church of St. Etienne in Caen. But it's, it's about the only one. It's the church that was built to house the relics. And the relics were taken from southwest Sicily by Bariot merchants, who it was said were afraid that the Normans would get to the relics before them. And the rationale here was if the liberators were stealing, then they'd be punished by the saints. So if you were successful in liberating the relics, the saint, in fact, approved. So there in the crypt of St. Nicholas, the relics remain to this day. And I think a bit lower down, yes, there we have the crypt of St. Nicholas with the shrine where Father Christmas is still installed. But... You do see in England, um, Westminster Abbey is very like the Norman Abbey of Jumierge. Um, experts are, are divided about which came first, but otherwise the churches put up in England are not actually like the churches put up in Normandy. They're far bigger and longer. In Italy, here we have uh, Santa Trinita Venosa, which uh, you've seen one of the Oakville tombs. And here you can see that it, there was an early medieval church, Byzantine church, with the circular baptistry. And in fact, a Roman, it was founded on the site of Roman baths. And that is interesting for anybody coming from Bath, because there you again have the reeds of a Roman site and before that, a Celtic site, then an early medieval church, and then the site of the coronation of King Edgar, before you get to the monastic complex built by Bishop John. This is the, the church tower Melfi, which again uh, is much more like an Italian church than anything to do. You wouldn't see anything like this in Normandy, to put it bluntly. And it was here at Melfi that Robert Keystar was confirmed in his lands by Pope Nicholas II. So what you have in England, as I say, is an interesting development in that the churches are far longer than anything in Normandy and they aren't following any, just apart from Westminster Abbey, distinctly Norman style. So... To round this up, in one sense, it's not surprising that the study of the Normans is moving in new directions, reflecting concerns of current historians. Environmental historians, for example, point to an improving climate around the year 1000. Perhaps Norman families like the Oakvilles were able to raise more sons to maturity because more food was available. If so, and if inheritance was channeled towards as the eldest son or sons, younger sons had to emigrate. Migration is another contemporary concern. The ancestors of Normans had been emigrant Vikings. In the 11th century, there were movements of peoples into Eastern Europe, across the Danube and westward from the steppe lands of Central Asia. And migration raises a further question, which uh, contemporary people are very interested in that of identity. As Normans moved away from their place of birth, did they keep that sense of Norman identity? And if so, for how long? How common was intermarriage with natives, especially in the Near East? And things like the study of human DNA may be able to throw light on this. But finally, we need to hang on as far as we can to the idea of the mentality of these people. Their careers, often bloody and short, as Joe said, were exciting. The ambitions of their leaders were said to have few limits. Robert Giscard was suspected, probably correctly, of aiming at the Byzantine imperial throne. William Rufus, whilst much later, claimed to have said he would invade Ireland by building a bridge. Where have you heard that before? But the sky was the limit for these people. So thank you. And I go back... I think to my last slide, 
which shows one of the most famous artifacts from the Sicilian world, which is the coronation mantle of Roger II. And I think this was a replica. I saw it more than 20 years ago in an exhibition in Caen. And what you have here is the great stone hall of the castle, either built by William Rufus, who built Westminster Hall, or by Henry I. But it's a nice example of Norman stone building, uh, housing one of the famous uh, textile relics from the Norman period. So thank you, Joan, and thank you, everybody, for listening. Well, thank you so much, Judith. That was a, an absolutely fascinating talk. Thank you. And so much interesting detail and content. And certainly, you know, with reading your book and hearing your talk, it's, it's changed my view of the Normans you know, a great deal. I mean, even to the extent that, for example, Norman churches are around England, which I love, um, realising I, I assumed that was Norman style from Normandy and, and elsewhere and finding that it's not is, is fascinating. So I'm going to um, open it up. If, if everyone else would like to uh, – actually, if you can stop screen sharing, Judith, that would be good. How do I do that? Uh, if you go down to share screen on the bottom and click, click the little kind of tiny upward arrow on the right, it should allow you to stop sharing. Um, um, if not, I think it's at the top. Oh, okay. Yeah, probably at the top. So, so would anyone else, feel free everyone else to um, uh, to unmute That's yourself right. and turn your videos on. Well done, we've stopped screen sharing. Um, so we've got uh, a question in the chat from Peter Chandler. Um, and if anyone's got a question they'd like to, like to ask after that, please feel free to raise your hand or, or whatever. So, um, so Peter asks, is there a clear distinction between Normans and Franks militarily or culturally, e.g. Franks in the Peloponnese? Um, I always associate Franks in the Peloponnese with it slightly later than than Normans. Is that am I right? Um, yes. Yeah, so you're a hundred years after yeah. um, the um, yeah the first Crusade. Yes. Yes. But I I was really forget that comparison for a moment. I mean, you could I could have said. In um, in the Near East, yeah, I think in the First Crusade the terminology is very interesting because there's only really one author who talks about the Normans and, and clearly identifies them with a the group, and that if you read the chronicles of the First Crusade, it's either the Franks or us, we, um, or Christians, not particularly Normans, but I, I would have thought. The Franks in the Peloponnese would have been Franks. <laughs> in France. Well, they, they were. I was saying their style, what they did, their opportunism. Yes, yes. Their, um, the way in which they suddenly discovered, hang on, um, we with a few hundred men are able to take on these people and we can read the divisions already here. Yes. Uh, so it's ready for taking. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. And it is an era, after all, when armed conflicts are usually pretty small scale and small groups of people can make really decisive gains. And, and the Normans, if you look at the numbers in the early years in Italy, there were very few of them. And then as they got sort of money that by threatening people or robbing them, then they could pay soldiers and they got the locals to fight for them. Now, opportunism. Thanks, Judith. Um, Michael Davis, uh, I know you submitted a question um, to me earlier. Is it, Would you like to mention that yourself to, to Judith about uh, Adelaide? If you unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Um, Yes, uh, I put in really a plug for Adelaide of Bath because we have a program running at Brisley uh, and have had for some number of years now on Adelaide, who's our fellow Bathonian. And um, his life and work were made possible by the fact that he was born into a Norman regime and he was protected by a Norman regime during his, uh, well, his life's work was 
uh, traveling in the Mediterranean and the Levant and learning Arabic and uh, engaging with the Studia Arabum, this huge, the body of world knowledge where the Arabs were so far ahead of us, 800, like 800 years ahead of us. Um, and he was translating the, um, this, uh, notable examples of this body of work from Latin, uh, into Latin from the Arabic, which made it available to Western Europe. Uh, but in terms of the Normans, um, it seems to us that it not only enabled him to um, uh, have this intellectual curiosity um, free of church, heavy church influence, but to travel as he did in uh, uh, the, those parts of the world um, that he did, that he, he, he was really uh, um, operating under the protection of what we've called a Norman bubble. Um, and he spent time in southern Italy and Sicily, and then at a later stage in the Levant, or well, in Antioch, he was based in Antioch. But what he did in his life was, um, uh, but he was, he has a special place in the history of uh, science and knowledge. But all of this was enabled by his good fortune at being, not being born into a Norman regime and protected by a Nor Norman regime throughout his life. And so um, I don't know uh, if you'd like to make any comments on that, but that is a sort of particular interest we have at Bath and the Brisley in particular, and this great, great Bartholia, uh, Abonia, Bartholian of ours, uh, uh, who we feel is a kindred spirit, really. So I, I, I read your um, very interesting synopsis of Adelard, and you're absolutely right about what he did and why he's important. Um, and the timing is undoubtedly uh, true that he is working at, in an era when there are more contacts between Northern and Southern Europe. I think the only thing I'd, I'd slightly widen it out would be to say that um, it's a two-way process as well and that, that there are also other cross-currents um, Petrus Alfonsi, the converted Jew, came from Spain to England and was um, also offering translations from the Arabic. And equally, um, the monks of Monte Cassino uh, and, and uh, the Archbishop of Salerno were very, very interested in Arabic medicine because Salerno was the great centre for medical studies. And, and so they were copying Greek manuscripts. But it's, in other words, it's an era, I wouldn't say so much as the protection of the Mormons, as it's an era when um, Northern scholars can take advantage of the channels of communication and travel to find the latest information in the areas that they're interested in. But it is an extremely important era, undoubtedly. Yes. He was very early in this process of translation and from Arabic into Latin. Yes. And it became a bit, a bit of an industry subsequently, yes. but he was one of the first. And, um, and it would be fair to say, I think, uh, again, slightly adjusting what you were saying, that he benefits from the fact that Henry the first, uh, for example, is stupendously rich, like Roger the second. And kings were very interested in astrology. Um, because they wanted to know when was the best day to do things. So, exactly. um, oh yes, he was a notable astrologer. Astrologer, was important in those days. Yes, and also um, the growing sense that uh, to be a good king or to be an, um, a, an elite person, a lay person, was a good thing to have to be educated. So, I think. Um, Adelard ha could have the patronage of lay people as well as, he, as you say, he didn't have to work through the church. No, so, no. Joe? As, oh, yeah. Joe. Yes, uh, Liam Fitzgerald, do you want to ask a question? Yeah, well, I'd just like to thank Judith for a lovely talk. Uh, I found it really interesting. And me being a Norman here in Dublin, Ireland, uh, I, I, 
I've been, I guess, uh, I had a little read of Julian Norridge's book on Sicily, which Judith might mm. know about. Yeah, which was fascinating, and, and you know, there was a lot about Roger in it. But um, not necessarily on a lighter note, but why the hell is there a statue of Rollo in Fargo? And why, <laughs> was good to... why didn't the Palm Brothers reference it in their drama? That's what I want to know. <laughs> as far, this, is, this is Google information. As far as I understand it, um, in Fargo, North Dakota, there was very strong Norwegian presence in the 19th century. And yeah. when um, uh, Norway broke away from Sweden, this statue was put up. It's the same statue that you see in Alisund in Norway, which I've seen. Um, so oh, there he stands in North Dakota. But I'm interested that if this Gerald has, has uh, spoken because it was Gerald of Wales, of course, who said that William Rufus was going to build a bridge to Ireland and then conquer it. <laughs> I know. And I was thinking of Boris and his, yeah, you know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, it was fascinating. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. Oh, no. it could be your ancestors then. Yeah, never too late. That's what I say. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we've got a question from David and Dillis. Um, Judith, from your comments about the number of Norman, Normans, i.e. Northmen in Normandy, would it be fair to say that the spread of Norman of the Normans was in fact the spread of Viking influence? That is extremely interesting, and that's one of the things that I, I have been thinking a lot about. Um, partly this question of identity, when do they stop thinking of themselves as Christianized Vikings? And the problem is that we only have this one chronicle of, about the early years in Normandy. And this is Dudo, and he's busy telling you all about how they took up Christianity and became good Christian rulers and so on. So it's not in his interest to tell you that they were still actually... Um, enjoying a sense of Scandinavian identity. But there is a there is a poem in the early 11th century by, about a man called Moriut who's captured and he and his wife are enslaved. And um, they end up, and he goes to the Duchess of Normandy, Gunnar, and says, I, I want my wife back. And she says, well, go, to, if you can find her, I will ransom her. And he goes to a place called Vaudreuil on the Seine, and she's there working as a, a slave in a, at a loom. So that shows that, that, that there's still slavery in Normandy in the early 11th century, and that there is still this idea of slave trading. Um, whether they all sat round with their drinking cups telling stories of the old Norse past, we just don't know, because, as I say, in fact, the chroniclers... Uh, who are clerical and Christian want you to think they put all that behind them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, can I invite anyone else for the question? I I wanted to ask one, Judith, about the, you used the term charisma, and you know, as far as I was aware, that's sort of the idea of charismatic leaders and the great men or great women, you know, version of history had sort of has gone out of fashion quite a bit. So I was quite pleased to hear you refer to charisma because I think just from lived experience, it feels like you know, significant people who, with a particular drive in the right circumstances can change the course of events. Yeah. I mean, like you, I suppose. I, I was educated to think that this was all very old hat and you, you didn't think in terms of great men, usually great men rather than great women. Um, but, but there's no doubt, I think, that people past and present have, have had charisma and have charisma. My husband laughs at me. I'm a late convert to football and Jürgen Klopp has charisma in spades. He absolutely has. And I think when you see it, you you recognise it, and I think these people did have charisma. The only thing I would add to that is that it's quite clear that the accounts we've got play down their failures. I mean, William the Conqueror's last years were unsuccessful. Bowman gets captured and goes back to France, and although he has this terrific speaking tour, he doesn't really get much in the way of help, and his last years are a failure. So because of the selective evidence we've got, the charisma side is built up. But I, I ended up thinking, well, yes, they did have it. 
And I think I think we have to add St. Anselm is another one, I think. Um, if you met St. Anselm, um, you, you knew you were in the presence of somebody special. Congratulations for getting a reference to Jürgen Klopp into a talk <laughs> about Norman, so that's very impressive. Um, well, look, I think we're sort of coming to this. Has anyone got a last thought or a question they'd like to throw in? Um, in that case, I think I hope you'll all join me in saying thank you to Judith for a really interesting, fascinating talk, in fact, yeah. and uh, engaging you presented. And, um, and well, I've really enjoyed it, so we'll show our appreciation. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, and I might take the liberty while we're in front of witnesses to say, would you mind if we kind of kept you informed of our Adelard campaign? Please do. Um, the big man, of course, on Adelard is Charles Burnett, but um, I, I'm very interested. Excellent. Well, we will do okay. that. So thank you again. Thanks to everyone for, for in, hopefully you enjoyed the talk and for your questions and so on. And um, hopefully we'll see you back at another BRLSI event soon. Uh, good night, everyone. Okay. Good night. Thanks, Joe. Good night. Thanks.